Okay, so I've started the recording and I'm going to here. All right, so we'll begin right now. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Riley Fisher, and I'm the founding club president of the U Windsor Anthrozoology Club. Although tonight's event is not on our campus, and many of you might be located elsewhere in the world, I would still like to acknowledge that the land on which the University of Windsor is located on is of the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of the First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples. We are grateful to work, learn, and live in this area. I would like to now to take the opportunity to formally introduce our guest speaker, Rob Laidlaw. Rob Laidlaw has spent more than 40 years working to protect the interests and well being of animals in Canada and around the world. He is a chartered biologist, founder of the wildlife protection organization ZooCheck, and a winner of the prestigious Frederick A. McGrand Lifetime Achievement Award for substantial contributions to animal welfare in Canada. Rob is also an award winning author of 10 children's books about animal welfare and animal wildlife protection, as well as numerous articles, reports, book chapters, and other materials. He has spoken to hundreds of audiences of all ages throughout the world and appeared in a broad range of media stories and documentary films. In his spare time, Rob likes to read a ton of books, explore caves, ride his bicycle both short and very long distances, hike in parks and reserves, watch animals in the wild, and travel to far-flung countries around the world. Before we begin, I would just like to briefly go over some housekeeping rules for our Q&A tonight. Um, after Rob's presentation, you will of course have the opportunity to ask Rob some questions. You'll notice in the top um, right hand corner of the team screen, um, you'll see a little smiley face with a little hand up. You can click that to raise your hand and you'll be put into a virtual queue um, to ask your questions. We'll be able to see the ordered list of who has their hand raised, at which point we'll call upon you once it's your turn. We just politely ask that you keep your microphone on mute until you're ready to ask your question. If you are uncomfortable or unable to use your microphone, you're more than welcome to use the chat box feature as well. We'll be monitoring that and we will ask your question on your behalf. Um, so without further ado, I would like to give the virtual floor over to our guest of honor, Rob Laidlaw, for his presentation, Reflections on Wildlife Captivity and Advocacy. Yeah, thank you, Riley. I'm going to uh, put on my uh, short slideshow uh, right from the start. Uh, can you give me a thumbs up if, uh, if you can see it? You are oh. good. Okay, we're good to go. Um, when I was in public school, I was always the kid that had read every book on animals in the library and every book on conservation, and I was always seeking information on animals. It was something that I, I don't know where the genesis of that interest came from, but it's been with me uh, ever since I can remember. And even in grades two and grade three and grade four, I remember thinking that uh, what I wanted to do with my life was something that would help animals. And I originally thought a veterinarian or a park ranger or some such type of activity would be where I went. But uh, I never imagined I'd end up being a political advocate, uh, advocate for wildlife for most, most, of, uh, most of my adult life, certainly. I've been doing this work now for about 40 years, about 30 years full time. Now, I became very interested in zoos at a very young age. I remember visiting the old Riverdale Zoo in Toronto. It was in downtown Toronto. It was about six acres in size, had several hundred animals, and it was very much an old style kind of facility. And it had the bars and the concrete, and it had a big cat house and a primate house. It was a typical sort of European style menagerie zoo. And it was actually one of the first uh, to become established in North America and certainly one of the first in Canada. Well, I remember going and thinking, well, zoos are pretty good. I, I, I like zoos and I like looking at the animals, but at the same time, even at that very young age with only a tiny fraction of the knowledge that I have today, I had uh, a level of discomfort with zoos. And I, I really, in my own mind, even though I, I generally supported them, uh, I, I really questioned some of the conditions that I saw that the animals were in. Well, that, that stayed with me, and I had visited all kinds of zoos throughout the years, and uh, eventually in 1984, 
Uh, as an adult, I attended just just quite by accident uh, the Wasega Beach Game Farm up up near Georgian Bay. And as someone who still supported zoos, even though I had that level of discomfort, I was absolutely horrified at what I saw. This zoo looked like the people who were running it had no idea what they were doing. The cages were makeshift, they were extremely small, they were barren, and I remember one young American black bear cub that had a chain around its neck and it was chained to the uh, the gate in a small travel cage and this poor little bear, who should have been with his mom out there in the wild, that poor little bear was uh, bawling his eyes out and you could hear him throughout the zoo and I inquired when I was leaving the zoo, what's going to happen to that bear? You know, that wasn't, uh, wasn't the nice situation. And, uh, I, I, I thought at the least I should ask them about that. And I'd never done anything like that before, challenge anybody on anything like that, but I decided I got to ask them. So I asked them at, when I was leaving at, at the admission booth and they said, don't worry, don't worry. Uh, that bear's only in there temporarily. And 15 miles down the road there, there's another zoo called the Elmville vale jungle zoo. And that bear will be going there. So I thought, oh, phew, this is good. And uh, and I should say that most of the other animals were in, in poor conditions, although, although not as bad as this poor black bear cub. Well, I dropped by at the Elmville Jungle Zoo um, after I left the Wasega Beach Game Farm, and I was even more horrified. It was uh, beyond anything I could ever imagine existing in the province of Ontario. There was excrement that was a meter deep. Cages looked like they hadn't been cleaned out in, in, in months or longer. Animals looked sick. The spaces were small. Many of the animals were exposed. Um, things I recognized were things at the time that you didn't need uh, a PhD in ethology. You didn't need to be a biologist. You didn't need to be a veterinarian to recognize as anybody who was compassionate walking into that facility, uh, you could see these things. And I decided uh, right then and there to start to look at the zoo issue and the plight of wildlife in zoos in Ontario. And originally, I thought it would be an 18-month project. And now, 40 years later, it's still ongoing. So, that was sort of the genesis of, of my involvement in zoos. And in 1988, I've started uh, this group called Zoo Check that I didn't think would still be around today, but obviously it is. And we work not only in Ontario, but across the country and overseas in places like Japan and Pakistan and India. We've worked in Mexico and other places around the world. And that's something I never could have envisioned a long time ago. So my perspective... Uh, is based on 40 years of involvement in uh, zoo and wildlife and captivity issues. And I'm going to, in the 20 minutes that I have to talk, um, give you just a very, very basic idea uh, of some of the things associated with zoos and aquariums and, and wildlife and captivity here in Ontario and a little bit in Canada. Uh, but again, we're going to just scratch the surface because I also want to talk a little bit about advocacy for animals. So let's start off with where do you find animals? Well, when you're looking at wildlife and captivity, there are uh, two major areas in which we uh, as regular citizens living in, uh, in Ontario and the rest of Canada may encounter uh, captive wild animals. And they tend to be in zoos and aquariums, which are familiar to everybody. Uh, and we also see very large numbers of wild animals kept as pets, so exotic pets, and they are sold in retail outlets through the internet and in specialty websites and shows and things like that. And many animals are also encountered by members of the public in mobile live animal programs. So they're taken either by pet owners or sometimes by zoos and aquariums, and they go out to daycares and elementary schools and middle schools and high schools and universities and religious institutions and corporate events and county fairs and parades and all these types of activities, uh, many of these animals will find their way out there and that's what, where people will encounter them. And they range from the smallest animals, the small amphibians uh, and small reptiles to some of the largest animals. 
So o- over the time that I've been involved, there's been some really interesting trends. And I have to say that the landscape of the issue, uh, wildlife and captivity issue in Canada, is dramatically different than it used to be. When I started, there were hundreds of, of roadside zoos, that's those amateur mom and pop type operations that uh, you know, carry out their activities with little knowledge and no money and, and uh, m- maintaining all the while very poor conditions for the animals, They're doing no education or conservation work or anything else. Well, those things were right across the country. And today, um, I'm ha- happy to say that there really aren't any of the classic old style roadside zoos west of Ontario. There really aren't any east of Ontario, and what exists in Ontario is just uh, the residue of what used to be here. When you look at animal attractions, zoos and aquariums and zoo-type exhibits across the country, we now have maybe 150 in all of Canada. And here in Ontario, uh, we've got the bulk of the zoos or zoo-type exhibits where members of the public can go and see animals, and we have about 40 in Ontario. So that's uh, a much smaller complement of uh, these types of operations than existed previously. And if we look at traditional roadside zoos, the, the worst of the worst, we've only got about 10 or 12 left in Ontario, and that's down from 60 many years ago. So what have, what have I seen uh, when I'm looking at wildlife and captivity? Well, over the years, public concern has gone up, and with it, public acceptance of these places has gone down. And when we go to policymakers across the country now, and especially here in Ontario, 20 or 30 years ago, we would walk in and policymakers would be supportive of zoos. Well, today they're not, and most of them are very suspect about any zoo business wanting to set up in their jurisdiction, and many of them are downright hostile to these types of operations coming in. And that is a massive change. We've seen government interest in these issues rise. And a lot of people, especially in the activist community, complain about governments. But I can tell you that there are people in government that uh, consider themselves animal rights activists in all parties, um, um, you know, that are out there uh, with uh, candidates running for election. There are uh, people in those parties that call themselves animal rights activists. And there are people that uh, in government that are willing to to get behind initiatives or to front initiatives to to help animals, and, and that's different than it used to be. They used to be polite, but sort of dismiss you, uh, you know, because animals were largely this peripheral issue, and you know they didn't really want to bother. But that's very different today, and because of some of that interest, we've seen more laws and regulations, not nearly enough, but but more than in the past, and that has caused roadside zoos and and some. Of the classical traditional zoos to close down. Uh, Circuses and novelty acts with wild animals in Canada are largely gone, but we have seen an uptick in the numbers of exotic pets of certain kinds being kept, and we have seen these mobile live animal programs grow in number, particularly in Ontario. In southern Ontario alone, we've documented about 85 of these businesses, and they operate largely off the uh, public radar screen, but they are a a huge problem. And then I'll just say one more thing about uh, the small exotics kept as pets has grown, but the large charismatic megavertebrates, you know, the lions and tigers, the big primates like baboons and apes and uh, the wild canids, those types of animals are very, uh, very much reduced in number. And in fact, 25 years ago, estimates placed the number of big cats in Ontario at at about 600. Some people thought up to 2,000 in the province. Today, in the hands of private individuals kept as pets, we can only identify about 30. So that's a massive change in Ontario. So what are the key issues with, with wildlife and captivity? Well, my organization were concerned about a lot of different facets of of these issues, but obviously, first and foremost, we're concerned about the welfare of the animals. And when you go throughout the province of Ontario, looking looking at zoos and looking at conditions animals are in, you find that uh, they're they're deficient in, in many respects and uh, in in many facilities. They're abhorrent. That they're, they're they're absolutely uh, doing nothing nothing at all to satisfy the 
biobehavioral needs of the, the animals. So animal welfare um, is something when you look at wildlife in captivity, what you want to think about uh, are, are three basic components of, of animal welfare. You have the biological functioning of animals. So, you know, the respiration, circulation, the uh, maintenance of muscle structure, and all the things that, that are involved in actually living. You know, there is that component, and that is often the component that is given most attention. And the two com other components, the triad uh, of, of uh, uh, animal welfare, um, the two other components that are often largely ignored are the psychological needs of animals, um, because all animals need to have uh, their their psychological needs addressed. It's not enough to just put them in in a physical space and leave them there. They need to have flexible, complex environments that create some stresses, that create challenges, that allow animals to problem solve, to do the things that they've evolved, to use their minds. And by doing so, that's how they make a meaningful contribution of to the quality of their own lives. And there are many, many people in, in academia that, that publish on animal welfare that, that put it in its simplest terms when you're talking about the second of the uh, three elements of animal welfare, uh, the satisfaction of psychological needs in that when, when they talk about it, they say that um, animals need to feel good. And I think that really sort of, uh, in, in a nutshell, describes um, that aspect of animal welfare. And then the third is that all animals in captivity should be allowed to live according to their evolved natural adaptations. So if they run in the wild, they should be able to run. If they dig, they should be able to dig. If they climb, they should be able to do a good portion of the things that they would do in the wild. So animal welfare for us is is at the top of the totem pole of priorities when we're looking at wildlife in captivity. But there are these other issues that you've probably already looked at on the screen, and they run from very uh, practical issues dealing with conservation and environmental risk to human health and safety nuisance issues, and even the costs associated with uh, regulating these types of animals regardless of where they may be. So common animal welfare problems. This is a picture of the Elmvale Jungle Zoo, uh, that one I described that I went to and I thought it was worse than Wasega Beach Game Farm. It's cleaned up a lot over the years, but it's still uh, a classic roadside zoo. And you can see there the list, I won't go through them all, but generally speaking in many of these facilities, you're going to see lack of space inappropriate substrates like that uh, hard pan substrate those lions are lying on, uh, poor environmental conditions, often barren cages, little stimulation, sometimes the social settings are completely inappropriate, often there's lack of shelter and privacy, poor food, I've even seen zoos that are feeding animals uh, burned meat uh, that are discards from supermarkets and restaurant waste and things like that. And what you find with with many facilities, both zoo facilities and particularly with exotic pets, is that bottom, uh, that uh, the item on the bottom of the list, incompetent or folklore husbandry practices. And those are are just practices that uh, are not based in in any evidence. They're just things that have been carried forward where one keeper may have, who wasn't doing things properly, taught the next, taught the next, taught the next, and it just gets worse and worse. Or they may, may be beliefs uh, that um, inform what, what's called folklore husbandry. And I'll just give you one example. There's a belief among many parrot keepers that it's okay to deflight birds and to not provide them with a proper social context when um, that's not based on any science that's convenience based and that that's an example, uh, a very extreme example of folklore husbandry. So you get these kinds of, of welfare issues that you see and I'll show you just a couple more examples with, with big cats. So we see the lions here at Elmville. Uh, this is at the Kilman Zoo and you can see another uh, African lion. Uh, in a very makeshift cage, super small, very barren. And you can imagine that lion could live 15, 20 or more years 
uh, living in that kind of a condition. That's not the kind of uh, environment any big cat should live in. It's completely and totally deficient in almost every respect. And then this is one from a now defunct zoo in Ontario. It just closed a few years ago where you had these very low fences and again, barren conditions, very small, no shelter. But what the proprietor had done was he took this old fridge and propped it open. And you can't see it, but there is a tiger with his paws hanging outside of that fridge. And when I would go across uh, the province and in the early days across Canada looking at these facilities, these are the kinds of things I would see. And they were uh, absolutely heartbreaking uh, um, on, in many instances. And of course, you know, in, in the course of all the time I've been looking at these facilities, I've also looked at all of the other so-called better zoos. Um, I, I don't actually think there are good zoos. I think there are bad zoos and there are better zoos, but I don't think there are good zoos. Um, and I don't have time to get into uh, m my explanation as to, to why I believe that. But I will just point out that uh, a lot of animals in the so-called better zoos, uh, their, their condition conditions are marginally better their care is is better their food may be better their uh vet care and things like that but they still are incarcerated in in spaces that are orders of magnitude smaller than they would ex ever experience in the wild and they're not nearly as complex or flexibility the animals don't have that uh high degree of stimulation that they would experience in natural or semi-natural settings and um i i try to tell uh, people that when they're looking at animals, uh, to think about them being in that cage where that cage may look sort of okay, or it may look sizable, but think if you were in there for a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, you know, in the space of a week, you're going to know every square inch of that environment. And if you're an intelligent animal like this gorilla or like many other animals, then you know within the space of that week you're going to become uh extremely bored of that environment uh it's a challenge to keep animals occupied physically mentally and uh socially and of course in the pet trade we see even more extreme confinement these are african clawed frogs uh and the upper left upper right is siamese fighting fish and then we have a couple of uh, 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 reptile show showing the conditions that those animals were kept in. And these uh, are, are beautiful examples of folklore husbandry where they are not evidence-based. They're, they're horribly uh, cruel. They're, they are completely deficient in satisfying any need of the needs of the animals. And these types of conditions are, are out there and they're informing people who come to buy these animals. The people who are putting these animals into these situations are the ones that are telling people how to care for animals. So when you look at the pet trade, it's even worse than zoos and aquariums. Now I put this slide in, it's from the Oakland Zoo and it's showing uh, 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 a golden frog. And you can see it up there in the corner. And I just want to, I, I put this slide in because one of the, the, the key aspects of uh, keeping wildlife in captivity is space. And, uh, and a lot of zoos and a lot of exotic pet owners say they don't need space. We give them food, you know, they're safe and, and all of that. But space is is critically important to animals and, and it, it's dismissed, ignored or overlooked to a large extent by many people who keep animals. And that's because it's e easier for them to do that. If you look at that tiny frog, uh, you can see how small that frog is compared to that tiny portion of the exhibit that I've included in this picture. Well, this exhibit is about 15 times or 20 times larger than what you're seeing uh, in this picture. So you can imagine the scale of that exhibit compared to the body length of that animal. Well, that type uh, of situation, that type of scale compared to uh, uh, of exhibit compared to body length is what we should be trying to do for all animals. And it doesn't matter if it's an elephant or a dolphin or a kudu or a zebra or an African wild dog or a frog or an anaconda or anything else. We should aim to give them environments that are not only complex and flexible, but that are hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of times longer than their body length. And this is something that you rarely see when you're looking at wildlife in captivity. 
I don't have time to talk about education and conservation, but what I will say is this is sort of the go-to argument for, for many facilities, particularly professional facilities, but also the roadside zoos. They will say that they do education and conservation. And um, I would just want to say one thing about each of those, uh, about education. There are these claims that looking at animals in cages is educational, but when you examined the, the peer-reviewed literature on that, you find that there is very little evidence that zoos are educating, uh, or other types of wildlife exhibits are educating casual visitors um, through the medium of the animal in the cage or the graphics that, uh, that are, are placed in front of the cage. There's very little evidence that that is providing any level of meaningful education, and there's virtually no evidence that it is resulting in changes in people's behaviors that that uh, promote conservation or help animals. And then in terms of conservation, typically what's what's thought about is captive breeding of endangered species, and there have been very, very, very few successes. Uh, if you look at zoos in Canada, you'll hear about black-footed ferrets, California condors, Wyoming toads, uh, Vancouver Island marmots, and a few other creatures. And if you look on, on a broader scale, there, there's about 15 or 20 or 25 different animals that constantly come up everywhere in the world. And zoos uh, and people who support zoos bring them out and say, this is why zoos exist. And the reason you have... Uh, only these 15 or 20 that keep coming out repeatedly again and again and again is because there, there aren't really any others. Uh, the, the contribution of zoos in terms of uh, captive breeding and reintroduction of species to the wild is, is pretty dismal. And in fact, if you look at uh, uh, what, what they've done, you don't find that it's been very much at all. And most of the programs that they claim are successes are not yet unqualified successes. So... Uh, Przewalski's horse and Arabian oryx and, and Puerto Rican crested toes and these other, they're, they're not yet unqualified successes. I always say that you don't need zoos uh, to do the conservation work that they do, which doesn't mean that what they're doing is bad. It's not, but it's so small, so negligible, such a tiny, tiny part uh, of what most zoos do um, that it really doesn't justify having the zoo there at all. So are there good zoos? Uh, like I said earlier, I like to say that uh, there are bad zoos and better zoos. I used to think there were bad zoos and good zoos, but my my perspective has, has evolved over time. And uh, I think when you look at modern zoos today, this is Destination Africa at the Calgary Zoo, you'll see that uh, they really are businesses and that the primary concern the, the primary driver, and this is manifested when you look at the capital budgets for the construction of exhibits or zoos, uh, you see that they really are focused on people, uh, on visitors, or as many zoos now say, customers, and they're focused on, on generating revenue. And you see that manifested in the way zoos are, are built and structured and operate and, and uh, how they evolve. So I would say that uh, some zoos are better than others, but uh, certainly zoos in Canada, we have a very, very long way to go to be places that are that are actually going to be of uh, significant, meaningful benefit to animals. So what are the challenges? Well, the practices in zoos and in the pet trade are widespread, accepted, and normalized. So there's often a reluctance by uh, policymakers to treat them seriously, although that is changing uh, quite dramatically in recent years. Uh, and that sort of ties into the next point about regulators often defer to keepers in industry. They look at people who keep these animals poorly as the experts when they should really be looking at the people who study them in the wild, the biologists and, and other people who, who know more about them and, uh, and the people who are animal welfare scientists. Uh, we have a lot of problematic laws in Canada that are inconsistent, vague or reactive uh, many of the standards that are promulgated in Canada and around the world are just too low and are not evidence-based. Many of them are, particularly in the pet trade, are, are folklore husbandry-based. We have outdated regulatory approaches, particularly with regard to exotic pets. We have large numbers of species that are overlooked or ignored by many laws. And I'll just give you one example. The uh, We're working in, in a couple of cities now on their local animal control bylaws, and they have prohibited lists. 
And those prohibited lists uh, cover, uh, generally speaking, when you're looking at mammals, maybe about 4,000 mammal species, because they tend to be mammal-centric and include all the zoo-type animals. Uh, so that leaves uh, probably about 2,000 or more uh, mammal species that are not covered by these bylaws. But then when you look at the other animals, the birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, you find tens of thousands of animals that are not covered by these laws. So most species of animals tend to be overlooked or ignored by laws, and then there tend to be minimal penalties. So I've just sort of scratched the surface on, on the zoo issue. I probably went way longer. So I'm going to go very quickly through some of my, my thoughts regarding advocacy. Uh, I think uh, uh, how to do advocacy is one of the most important things that any of us who have been around for a while should talk about because uh, most people uh, in this sector, the animal welfare, animal rights sector in Canada, I don't think really have um, uh, uh, a good idea um, how, how to approach issues. Now, when you're talking about advocacy, there are different kinds of campaigns. There are finesse campaigns. There are political public pressure initiatives, there are consumer campaigns, there are campaigns where you're just trying to raise awareness about something or or do something symbolic. And some of them work some of the time and, and there's nothing wrong with that. What I tend to do and what I've done for many, many years are what are called public policy advocacy uh, campaigns. So I'm looking at trying to get uh, changes in policies or laws in government. And that's where my remarks are going to relate best. Now, in, in Canada, uh, you probably already know we live in a representative democracy, and that simply means that elected officials are supposed to represent the constituents, uh, the values, the perspectives of the people who elect them. Now, that not, isn't always the case, but that's supposed to be generally how it works, and sometimes it does. And one thing that that many uh, advocates uh, seem seem to forget or, or or don't realize is constituents of politicians are the people that have the most power. There's a saying in advocacy that all politics is local, and that's because of that fact that constituents have the most power. The people who elect somebody uh, have the most power with that elected official, and then residents of the immediate area are typically the second most influential. Now that's not a 100% hard and fast rule. It doesn't occur all the time, but most of the time that is the case. And when you look at how elected officials respond to advocacy, you'll find that they're not typically responsive, responsive to people from outside of their ward or their city or their riding if they're a provincial politician. And yet you often see many groups getting online and doing petitions where they have people from Togo and England and the United States and all that, you know, uh, signing a petition for some some issue in, in a municipality. Well, that that's that's pretty useless uh, because uh, elected officials uh, are most concerned about uh, their constituents and what their constituents are saying and not everybody else. And there are many politicians, both in, the Can in Canada and the U.S., where whenever they get something from another jurisdiction, it gets uh, tossed. They don't, they don't even uh, look at it. So, you know, all politics is local and constituents have the most power. That's an important uh, concept to understand. The second concept that I want you to understand is that a lot of people that are advocates approach politicians or people within uh, bureaucracies of government, and they don't seem to understand that uh, they don't think the same way. You know, we are generally uh, anomalous compared to the, the the broader suite of people that exist in our society, uh, and not that many people might think exactly the way we do. So that, that's got to be something that's factored in when you're approaching policymakers and bureaucrats. As well, they may not be familiar with the issue you bring to them. So, you know, you have to cultivate them and educate them uh, about your issue. And they may have a massive workload. So don't expect them to drop everything that they're doing and jump on your issue unless they're already super interested that probably will not happen. And until your item becomes something on an official agenda, or there's been official complaints, or there's been something in the governmental process, then 
it may not get their attention at all. So it's it's good to understand that that you know they they don't think the same way. They have huge workloads and they may not be familiar with their issues. So that's your starting point, and you should assume that that's going to be the case with everybody. So what do you do? Some basic steps. I can't possibly describe. Um, typically, uh, an advocacy workshop would run a day to three days long, and that would even then give you only sort of a brief overview. But I'll give you a, a few brief points. Number one, you got to learn your issue. Um, if you're an advocate, you should know as much as you possibly can about your issue, because if you don't know about your issue, if you can't answer basic questions, and there's usually about 10 or 12 that come up that everybody asks, whether it's media or bureaucrats or policymakers, members of the public, you have to be able to answer those basic questions about your issue. And if you can't, you don't have any credibility. Number two, you've got to understand the system. There are many, many advocates that I've encountered that uh, are, are very well-meaning, but you know they, they may be trying to get a change at a local level, but they don't understand how that change occurs. You have to understand how change occurs, whether it's municipally, provincially or federally, depending upon what you're doing, uh, the actual steps that occur, what might happen during those steps, and who makes the decisions that you want made. And that's something that's often called a strategic inquiry, where we're, you're basically learning the landscape of the issue. And that's very important. You have to understand the system. If you don't understand the system and how it works, you're probably not going to get anywhere. You also have to use the information that you acquire in that strategic inquiry to decide on, on a feasible goal. What, what are you trying to achieve? You know, we would all love to see a vegan world or an end to zoos or all that, but things don't work that way. They tend to move incrementally from one step to another, to another, to another, to another, as you move closer and closer to your goal. And we've had issues like that where we've been working for five, 10, 20 years moving the bar forward. And uh, that's very important. And you want to look for diversity of support, not just the usual suspects, get everything on the record. And I'll, I'll just give you one more point. It's be surgical. Think about how you do things and what will be most effective. And I'll give you one example. If you're trying to do something in a community uh, and you've got 12 members of council and you've got 50,000 people in your community. Well, it's uh, a lot easier to get four members of council thinking the way you do and accepting what you say than it is to get thousands of people in, in that 50,000 person community to try to pressure their politicians. So be surgical. Think about how you can be most effective, how you can scale things up, how you can manage your workload and then get ready to work because it is a lot of work. And I think I'm going to, to stop there. Hopefully, uh, a few of the things I had will uh, trigger some questions. Uh, like I said, we're only scratching uh, the surface on, on the wildlife and captivity issue and on advocacy, but hopefully uh, there'll be a few questions. So I'm going to stop there because I've already probably spoke uh, longer than I had expected. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Rob. Okay. I'm going to get. We will see you in a minute now. Um, Sorry, Riley, Riley, you're, you're echoing. echoing. Okay. Okay. Tammy, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Um, um, we, I, mean, we, I mean, we can't say thank you enough for your time. I am getting all of that information. Um, um, I, can I can actually, actually start, off start off with a question, question that, I, that I had. Um, um, I know, I that, know you that you said your focus, focus is on the legal, legal side of things. things. However, I'm curious. If you were to attend a circus or zoo protest and had to make a sign, what would your sign say? I, I have to give you a non-answer. Um, in more than 40 years of doing this work, we did one protest. And that protest was in 1996 at Marineland in Niagara Falls, Ontario. And the reason we did that protest was because we were holding just down the street from Marineland an international conference of dolphin advocates. So we had about 200 of the leading, the world's leading dolphin and whale advocates at, at a hall down the street from Marineland. And we did this to help uh, publicized the fact that the, this big international meeting was occurring. 
Uh, protests can be uh, a useful uh, a useful tactic, but where uh, I think a lot of um, activists fall short with regard to protests is they they use them either as standalone events, and if they're not in the context of a broader strategic initiative, then you know the chances of them ever ever actually achieving anything meaningful are are, are pretty remote. Uh, but a lot of activists don't don't. Uh, conduct them uh, in in the context of the, a broader strategic initiative, or they do a series of protests uh, in the hope that somehow they will create enough noise and enough pressure to create uh, uh, or or get beyond a threshold at which somebody responds. It could be government, it could be in a place of a case like Marineland, it could be the owner, uh, or it could be the municipality. And I think. Uh, you know, as a tactic, protests are okay, but as standalone events, uh, uh, as uh, a series of them being being conducted as as uh, public policy advocacy events, that that doesn't work. And uh, what I what I often tell people, because people tend to, when they first get involved in animal advocacy, they they tend to to gravitate towards three areas. One of them is protests or public events. One of them is social media, and uh, uh, one of them is is doing petitions. And when I when I'm talking to people about advocacy, I tell them uh, to put those aside and design a campaign where you're not using protests or public events, where you're not using social media, and where you're not using uh, petitions, and see what you come up with because that's what's lacking with many of of the uh, uh, the protests that that are conducted out there there's no you know broader initiative that it ties to and then another way that they fall short is that uh, protests you know they're not very good for getting media they don't really put a lot of pressure uh, on, on a place you know like marine land um, but what they where, where they can be, enormously useful are as recruitment events. So if you've got 50 or 100 or 200 or 500 or 1,000 people at an event, well, you should be booking a hall or having some location down the street where you're telling everybody at the event, okay, thank you very much. You know, let's get motivated. Let's do the rah, rah, rah. We'll chant and we'll feel better. But, you know, right after the event, let's go down to the hall that we've rented and let's do our community organizing, our political organizing. And I've rarely ever seen that happen. And that to me is one of the, the most valuable ways that uh, protests uh, can be used or as recruitment events. So uh, sorry for the long answer, but you know, in, in all the years that I've been doing this, we've only ever done the one protest. Uh, we do not use them because we don't think they're, they're very effective in public policy advocacy campaigns. Thank you. Thank actually, you, actually, I think that's, that's a, a very, very good answer. answer. Um, I, I, I did I, not think I, you'd come at me with that, and I think that that was honestly very perfect. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question at the moment? I see, I see Amy, Amy Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald. Go ahead. Go ahead. There we go. Okay. Hi, Rob. Um, thanks for the the presentation. Uh, informative as as usual. And I'm I wanted to thank you for all of the years of amazing work that you've done. And I'm wondering if if you can share your thoughts on the Jane Goodall Act. And then I'm I'm also wondering if um, if you know the status of the Greenview Aviaries. Last I heard, it was for sale. And um, and there was a local effort to uh, to try and prevent the sale to to another zoo. So I'm just wondering if you have any information on that. Oh, Rob, I believe your microphone is still on mute. Yeah, hi. Uh, we don't actually have any additional information on Greenview. We've made uh, queries to try to find out what the status of things are, but uh, we haven't been successful, but we're hopeful that we will 
uh, in in the near future. Obviously, you know, the zoo is 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 a private entity, and they with no regulations in Ontario, they can sell uh, the zoo to whoever they want. And uh, I, I really hope that they end up uh, selling it to somebody for the property and not for the zoo. I think um, you know it would be a challenge to disperse all those animals. Uh, if you wanted to do it humanely, it wouldn't be so hard if you do it through brokers and just try to dump them into the pet trade just to make a few bucks, which which could be the scenario that surfaces if somebody just buys it and doesn't care. But um, uh, I really hope somebody just buys it for, for the property and, uh, you know, we will, uh, all of us collectively, if, if the opportunity arises, uh, do what we can to help help the animals we could certainly right now move all the cats and and you know many of the other large carnivores that are there uh we could probably have them out of there in a week if if somebody called us um some of the other animals would be a little bit harder to place and some you know it may be a case where the humane thing to do would be to make those hard decisions and euthanize them but uh, i think uh, regardless of of uh you know where where the animals uh could end up uh, the place should close. It, it's an abomination. We've advocated for its closure for for decades. It's it's I think uh, uh, it it's an embarrassment to the province of Ontario, um, and it's one of the last of its kind. So, um, but I'm I'm hopeful we'll find more information. We always have feelers out there, and you know we do use investigators and other people uh, to find things out. And uh, eventually we will will find out. Ho hopefully it'll be sooner rather than later, and we can uh, apprise people of of what what the status of that situation is. With regard to the Jane Goodall Act, uh, we actually helped in the, in the drafting of it, and a lot of the uh, animals. Uh, you know the 800 species that are included. Uh, we were involved in, in in getting onto that list, and uh, it's not perfect, but I think it's groundbreaking. Um, you know, it is something that 20 or or 30 years ago, if you had told me would this type of bill would ever be even drafted and talked about, uh, let alone you know it having uh, some some chance uh, of actually going somewhere. Uh, back then, I would have said, you're crazy. We will never in my lifetime see something like this. And uh, uh, I do think it's groundbreaking. I think it completely uh, changes uh, um, the way that uh, the law looks at animals. You know, it, it's giving them... Uh, 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 a different type of, of status under the law where they're not commodities and they're not, not property like toasters and, and fridges and cars. You know, it, there's a lot of, of um, uh, verbiage in the bill about best interests of animals, not causing harm, uh, only uh, allowing the use of animals where it is non-harmful research or there's a bona fide conservation benefit. Uh, or for sanctuary or rescue, uh, I think you know that that's uh, really important and and is groundbreaking and something that we we've all been struggling to to get uh, e even the foot in the door on for for many years. And then of course you know uh, the Jane Goodall Act is going to end uh, if passed as is will phase out the captivity of elephants. I think that that is a huge statement. You know we were able to get some elephants out, out of Canada and and uh, Jake Vesey got elephants out of the Calgary Zoo and, you know, Granby now is going to move their elephants elsewhere. And, uh, you know, I think we'll, we'll uh, see a time whether this bill are, is passed or not. Uh, and, and partially just because of the fact that this exists, that there will no longer be elephant captivity in Canada. And I think it, it's absolutely... Uh, uh, astonishing that there are more than 800 species that will be afforded protection where you know it will no longer be a canadian free-for-all it will be uh, a regulatory regime and you can always improve on them no matter how good they are but it it will be a different situation it won't be anything good sorry about that i accidentally hit mute at the, just at the last 20 seconds like the last 10 seconds oh, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say there's so much in the bill. It's hard, hard to, uh, I'm thinking of different parts of the bill. The one other thing I was very excited about is uh, uh, the designation of animal care organizations. And I know some people will say, well, there's seven uh, association of zoos and aquariums accredited zoos in Canada that will automatically qualify as, uh, you know, animal care institutions under the act, I have no problem with that because all the rest won't. Uh, and I think they will be hard pressed to to satisfy the criteria that are going to be applied. Uh, but I was very gratified to see that it was, uh, that what was referenced in the Jane Goodall Act was the AZA standards. They're much better than the Canadian zoo standards. And then we had also suggested that they couldn't just include a zoo standard, that they had to include standards for sanctuaries because there are, you know, very good sanctuaries uh, that are members uh, of the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries and that are accredited. But they also had to go further. They also had to include uh, and, and capture all of these other facilities out there that put even the best zoos in the world to shame. I have a friend who built a bear sanctuary in Wisconsin. He's not affiliated with anybody. Uh, and he's got one of the best bear facilities I've ever seen. So there are people who are running uh, facilities or operations out there that have uh, amazing places. Some of them that that are, are sanctuaries or rescues of a different type. Some that are you know focused on conservation um, that are out there that had to be captured. And it was really exciting to see that for the first time ever, it wasn't just oh we'll include the zoos. It was, let's capture all of these very relevant and very valuable businesses, operations, and institutions that are out there, and not to give exclusivity because you're a member of this club or that club. So uh, I mentioned a few things, but I think it's groundbreaking. Uh, whether or not it passes, I don't know, but I still think it'll have uh, a far-reaching and long-lasting effect, and it's it's just amazing to see it. Thank you, Rob. Uh, that's a great answer. I have one quick question in the chat, chat. and then there is two hands still up. I don't know how much time you have, but um, um, our question in the chat is, how did you get into writing children's books? And it comes from Emily. I, I have to admit, and my partner Holly is absolutely horrified that I actually mentioned this to people. Uh, I'm not a kid person. Uh, I've never been a kid person, and I've never actually held a held a, a child. Uh, so I'm the most one, one of the most unlikely people in the world to write children's books. But I had an opportunity back in 2008 where a publisher called me uh, just out of the blue because of all of my work with zoos over the years, and said, you know, we're thinking about doing a, a children's book on zoos. And uh, oh, sorry, let me step up a bit. They called and said we're thinking about doing a children's book, could you come and meet with me? I, I'm, I'm the owner of the company and my children's book editor. And can you meet, meet me in the restaurant at this hotel? So I went down to the meeting and my partner says, what's it about? And I said, I don't know, some book. And she goes, who goes to a meeting without finding out what it's about? And I said, well, I'm, I'll find out when I get there. So, so I get there and uh, they said, look, we're thinking about doing a children's book on Zeus and we would like you uh, to do it with uh, somebody from the Calgary Zoo. And I said, Ooh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I probably don't see eye, eye to eye on, on most issues. And we ended up talking just, just generally about a whole bunch of different issues. And at the end of the meeting, they just said, well, do you want to do it yourself? And uh, I thought, well, what what could happen? I've never written a children's book. What could happen? They'll print 1,500 copies and they'll be in, you know, the remainder bin for 25 cents after a month and that'll be it. And so I wrote this book called Wild Animals in Captivity, all about zoo issues. And uh, it sold more than 10,000 copies. And in Canada, a bestseller, believe it or not, is 5,000 copies. So it did very well. And it was published in Japan and the US and all that. And uh, one thing led to another, and I started doing more and more and talking to children's uh, children audiences across the country, you know, in BC and Newfoundland and everywhere in between. And uh, now I'm working on books number 11 and 12. So 
Uh, I'm really surprised uh, by this. I'm surprised that anybody reads them. They're in thousands and thousands of schools and libraries uh, across North America and in other parts of the world. And I get lots, lots of feedback from people who are using them, read them. In fact, I got one from uh, this morning from a teacher in Japan where they're doing a curriculum on animal welfare and they're using wild animals in captivity, which was published in Japanese as part of uh, the foundation of the, that part of their curriculum. So it's nice to see the messages getting out there. It's an audience I never even knew existed prior to just by chance having this opportunity. And, uh, you know, uh, I'll continue writing them for a little while, but that's how I got involved. Riley, you want to take it to the hands? Thanks for that, Rob. Yeah, for sure. So uh, the first on our list, we have a question from Andrew. I'm going to um, allow you to unmute yourself, Andrew, and you're in good to question. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rob, for your uh, presentation. Uh, Amy uh, anticipated my question about the Jane Goodall Act. I just wanted to follow up on a couple of details of the Act because uh, I've been working on it and compare, comparing it to the first version. Uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, I, I agree with you that there's no such thing as a good zoo. I, I agree with you that there are businesses, but you've mentioned that there's a number of them are, that are already designated with permission for permits under this, this current version of a bill. That includes breeding great apes. And so I'm just wondering, given that these are businesses, they're not good to us. Um, I mean, I, 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 I don't know if it's a precedent in Canadian law and Canadian proposed bills that could become law that they would protect some businesses over others, because this seems to be a very cynical move of a number of these uh, bigger zoos. And I'm just wondering um, why you would think that that doesn't undermine the um, uh, goodness of this bill. I mean, I, I would have thought that any zoo that can actually, any big business that's a zoo that can write itself into having its own special permits in a, in in under law, when they actually should be regulated by this law, is a loss, not a win. Oh, Rob, I believe you're on mute. Yeah, I think there will be uh, regulation under this law, certainly for certain species, but I totally understand your point. I agree. I agree. Uh, in doing this work um, over the years, and I would say that probably 80% of everything we've done over the last uh, 38 years at Zuchek has been uh, in the political arena. And there are political realities associated with this bill. Uh, it's it's a shame that you know primates and research were not included. It's, it's a shame that we couldn't just say, hey, let's just get rid of zoos. It's an outdated concept altogether, and they don't really do the things that they're they're supposed to do. You know, there are there are things that that will be distasteful to some people in the bill, but to 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 move the bar forward, um, you know, there there are political realities that, that have to be recognized and dealt with. So I think some of what you're seeing with the bill, like the inclusion uh, as uh, qualified animal care organizations of, of the AZA accredited zoos, I, th I think uh, that's just a political reality. Without the support of those institutions, those businesses, uh, I think this would be dead in the water. So to me, yeah, there are some some distasteful things, but uh, the the return uh, is is worth what what what's being given up, so to speak, if, if that makes any sense. Thanks. Okay, and um, it looks like our other question is from Robin. So Robin, at the top, um, there will be kind of near the leave share screen, there will be a mic. I don't know if you have the ability to Hit that and unmute yourself, but give me one sec. Try that. 
There we go. Now it's working. Perfect. Thank you for the presentation, Rob. Um, I'm currently an anthrozoology master's student, and uh, my question is based more on my background, which uh, most of my interaction with captive wildlife is through wildlife rehabilitation, especially the, the smaller sort of um, out of people's backyards, just about size organizations, not the, the big, big ones. And one of the, the questions that always seems to come up is the challenge of um, the wildlife that can't be released. And it's, it's the question of, does that animal get euthanized or does that animal get um, kept for educational programming? And I know you had the third section on outreach uh, mobile programs that you didn't have time to get to, but um, I'm wondering what that, what that means for you as far as like, where does that welfare and, and ethics lay, um, especially for a lot of those or organizations that's not only their means to not have to euthanize the animal for state regulations, but it's also um, one of their few sources of income as well as doing the outreach programs for schools and such. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are on those. Okay. In a perfect world, I don't think we'd have any of these programs at all. I think it puts undue stress uh, of, of all kinds on the animals that are involved. And as you move down into certain kinds of animals, those stresses are exacerbated by that kind of activity. So, you know, people that are taking around reptiles and smaller birds and other creatures, I think, are doing a tremendous uh disservice to those animals in in every way uh a lot of the shows that i've seen done done by rehabbers have been with uh birds of prey you know where there has been a wing loss or or something else and the animals are kept in uh an aviary setting and they've got you know tiered uh perching and all that so they can move around in the cage but they still can't can't fly uh i i I'm not not a fan uh, of using those animals. Uh, I haven't seen a, a, a very much in, in the way of, of meaningful benefits coming from using them that way. But when I th when I think about the animals themselves, I, I, I and and it may sound very harsh to say, but I honestly think that a lot of them would be better off dead than being. Uh, in the case of like a bird, bird of prey, uh, not being able to fly, not being able to do the things that it's evolved to do and being stuck on a perch in a cage somewhere, even if it can move around to a, to a certain extent, I, I think that that animal might, might be better off dead. Um, and, uh, you know, I've said that ever since, since I, I first started doing this work and, and it, it, you know, makes a lot, a lot of people uncomfortable, but, um, I, I really think, you know, there are so many of these animals out there that those really hard decisions, those difficult decisions have to be made. And I think for a lot of animals, uh, you know, that that would be the preferable option. A friend of mine who's a uh, quite a famous wildlife vet in the UK would always say, look, death is not a welfare issue. And I've all, always remembered that. And, you know, obviously you want uh, euthanasia of an animal to be a last resort, but uh, I don't think uh, keeping that animal alive when when it can't do what it's supposed to do uh, is warranted. And and I would say the same for you see this with reptile rescues where, you know, they'll they'll supposedly uh, an outfit a business or a zoo or whatever will rescue a, a bearded dragon or an agama lizard or something else, and they'll rehome that animal it's stuck in, in a you know a slightly bigger aquarium in someone's basement or bedroom for the rest of its life i think you know that that's another case where i i really think the animals would be better off dead they have no quality of life they're they're living museum pieces that are just uh stored there and and waiting to die so i'm not i'm not a fan of that uh although i do recognize the benefit that certainly in the case of of re rehab centers and that I do understand that the benefits of revenue generation accrued by these types of activities. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm gonna call on Danielle next for their question. Give me one second. I'm gonna give you permission to unmute your mic. And you should be good to go. 
Thank you for a fabulous talk. Um, what you described for the roadside zoo situation in Canada seems to me much better than uh, my impression for the United States. So I'm wondering, the countries are similar in at least some respects, right? So can we use this comparison to think about like what really gives us leverage here? Like, do you have any insights into what has made the difference for Canada as compared to the US? Yeah, and and I I would say that uh, one of the key factors is ZooCheck. Uh, there is no equivalent organization in the United States. We started working on these issues in 1984, and we've never let up. And uh, I would say certainly we've seen our fingerprint on, on virtually all of the legislation that's arisen uh, provincially. And we've been involved in about 250 different bylaw initiatives across the country that deal with wildlife and captivity issues and in numerous federal initiatives. And as well, uh, key lawsuits like uh, our six actions for Lucy the Elephant things and, and, and things like that that have uh, really sort of uh, added to the whole discussion and, and debate about the broader wildlife and captivity issues. Uh, there's no analogous organization in the United States that is sort of focused that way. And there uh, hasn't been any in Europe, uh, except for the Born Free Foundation. They originally started, and this is an interesting story, they started the same week of the same month of the same year as Zuchek in Canada with the same name because they used to be called Zuchek. And two years later, they, they contacted me and said, would you think about changing your name because we're called Zuchek? And I said, no, I can't now. Uh, so it was this weird coincidence where we both started uh, exactly the same time uh, with the same name and and uh, curiously enough, uh, PAWS, the PAWS Sanctuary in California, also started at that month of that year. A bunch of groups started. and But the uh, ZooCheck, after seven years uh, operating in the UK, became the Born Free Foundation, and they expanded uh, to a whole variety of other kinds of activities with a component dealing with zoos, but, um, you know, a, a much larger suite of, of activity. So I would say that in Canada, we have pushed and pushed and pushed. Uh, and uh, we work like crazy. We are absolutely desperate to win. We don't consider losing a possibility. And uh, and I think that you see that manifested in our record, although we don't promote it. Uh, you know, you don't see a lot of that on social media or anything. But um, you know, and and I and I'm saying this without any ego or anything. We don't think we're the greatest thing since sliced bread or anything. But we've consistently been there pushing all these issues for 38 years, and we've accumulated profile political contacts, media contacts. We've worked with groups across the country. And on, on just to give an example of, of how diverse that is, we are now pulling in on some of our, our campaigns in Ontario dealing with reptile zoos. We are pulling in environmental groups, public health officials, uh, traditional humane societies and others that normally don't get involved in these advocacy things. So we're cultivating this very diverse and, and dynamic base uh, of, of interest to, to get behind uh, the changes we're trying to achieve. So, uh, you know, I, I really think it's been uh, to a large extent just being there and, and pushing these issues and doing it in the right way. We've always been extremely political. We figure we don't want to waste our time, you know, if if we're just going to do things that aren't effective and we're not seeing tangible accomplishments at the end of every year, policy changes, new laws and zoos closed. Uh, and by the way, we've been involved in, in some way, shape or form in closing 50 zoos in Canada. So, you know, I don't think anybody else can say that, not even, even the bigger groups that get involved in this. And, uh, you know, I just think being there and, and being smart and being surgical about how we approach issues and wanting to win. Des and I can't overstate at all how desperate we are to win. We will do anything 
to win. And I think that's been a factor in changing the landscape of the issue. And I remember when when I first started, it was very interesting because uh, we used to be members of the National Zoo Association and speak at their conferences and at AZAC conferences in the U.S. and all of that. And the the sort of higher ups in the zoo industry, I remember them telling me, and I'm, uh, it's just a, an interesting story. But I just wanted to mention it because it just you know it, it illustrates. A, our, our staying power. And it's not just me, it's other people as well. But I remember them saying, well, you know, these places are going to be around a lot longer than you are and nothing will change. And you're, you know, it's, you have no resources and all this. And I said, no, no, we're going to win. We're going to win. And, uh, you know, things are entirely different now. And now, you know, we're putting a great deal of emphasis on the exotic pet trade and we're hearing the same things well there's too many of these people out there you know uh, how are you gonna fight them and all this and i'm thinking no we're gonna win they are super vulnerable we don't care how many people they've got we know what we're doing and we're gonna win we're gonna set those precedents we're going to establish that political foundation we're going to move the bar forward we see that manifested a little bit with the jane goodall act hopefully it gets passed but you know we're making huge gains now on exotic pets in just three years of, of activity. So, um, so I, I guess the long answer, and please, I hope nobody, you know, sees this as egotistical or arrogant, but in all honesty, I think it's being there, us, us being there and working so hard on these issues. Thank you. Um, Rob, do you have time for another question? One last one? Okay, so um, it's from Ken. He has his hand raised. I'm going to give you the permission to unmute yourself. And then, Rob, you just have to unmute yourself each time because we have to mute you because you echo the echo. Hi, Rob. Thanks for uh, presenting this evening. I really appreciate your comments about um, the zoos being involved in the uh, Jane Goodall Act. Uh, some good insight there. My question's about uh, veterinarians, however. Um, I've noticed, and for example, I know one vet personally who has her own private practice for companion animals, and she was also hired as a vet at a roadside zoo. And what I've seen over a period of time is a difference in her um, uh, like clinical standards for her companion animal practice compared to what she, what's acceptable at a roadside zoo. And I was wondering if you had any comments on that or any ideas how to close that gap. That's a real challenge and it's a long-standing problem across the country and we've encountered uh, veterinarians who, hey, it, it's a business and they're just trying to make a buck and this is another client that's going to pay the bills that they send them. You know, uh, that's unfortunate, but those people do exist. We, we have encountered other people who feel that if they can go in and improve the conditions of animals and provide quality vet care, then they're actually helping those animals. So there's sort of a continuum uh, of perspectives of veterinarians when when you're looking at you know the 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 broad uh uh complement of them that that attend to to animals in these kinds of situations uh what we've done to try to to edge things in a direction uh of uh vets being more progressive and more proactive and and even becoming advocates is to get out there and talk to them more. A lot of veterinarians are, are well-versed with dogs, cats, and maybe some of the other smaller uh, companion animals, and possibly including rabbits, although many vets are not that well-versed in rabbits. But, you know, they're usually well-versed in those creatures, but they're not so well-versed in uh, the other animals. Uh, and if they are, it tends to be the, the health aspects of those animals and not anything else to do with the animals. So there's so many vets that you could uh, ask to look at an animal and they may be able to make some kind of assessment of the actual physical health of that animal. And then, of course, if, if they, they don't have a definitive diagnosis as to what's wrong with the animal, maybe they'll do this test or that test or they'll, they'll have uh, ways uh, of trying to make, the, make that as assessment. But when it comes to how they're kept, vets uh, generally don't have any training. Uh, there's no training for zoo vets in Canada. There's no certification for, for reptilian veterinary care uh, in Canadian vet schools. 
And a lot of it is either you get into the industry and you take advantage of whatever is in the broader industry in the US and Europe and elsewhere, uh, or you uh, learn through other ways. Um, so a lot of the vets, and I've gone and done assessments, we've done provincial assessments where we bring a vet and they don't know what they're looking at. They don't know, you know, what makes a good lion cage, how far, you know, should there be in terms of uh, horizontal space for a cheetah to run? You know, should these lizards or, or these animals have this arboreal space or if they're fossorial, how, how, how deep should the substrate be? Like they don't know these things. Uh, they don't know about enrichment. They don't know about all these aspects of husbandry management care uh, and uh, as well safety. So, Many of them are at a loss. They can come in and say, well, we can treat this disease or we can find out what it is, but they don't know about the rest of it. So what we are trying to do is, is encourage veterinarians and uh, 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 make them aware uh, of a lot of these issues, a lot of the, the conditions that uh, are out there to uh, ask them to uh, think about uh, these types of situations a little bit differently and more expansively beyond just, you know, the the immediate medical needs of the, of those animals and, and to look at things more holistically. And I think that's something that's manifested in a lot of the literature now when you're looking at animals to look at them. You know, there's there's one health and there's this and there's different systems where they're incorporating different facets of of uh, animal biology and husbandry and all of that. So we get out there. I've I've done all kinds of uh, presentations at veterinary colleges. We're actually working on one right now uh, with uh, a vet college in um, uh, uh, the, the Maritimes where we're trying to set up workshops for their veterinary students and faculty to attend as well as outside veterinarians. We ran uh, in 2018 and 2020 a national series of workshops on, on exotic wildlife and captivity issues. So that was geared towards public health officials, uh, policy makers, uh, fish and wildlife people, animal welfare professionals and veterinarians. And the response was a fantastic. So we're getting out there and trying to give information and encouragement and to provide case studies that, that illustrate why, you know, they should be more cognizant of, of all of these things. And, and slowly but surely, you know, we're seeing an uptick in the number of, of veterinarians uh, that want to get involved. But we have that huge impediment where we don't really have that specialty training here in Canada. So it's, it's, it's a long, slow road. So uh, maybe that gives you a little bit of uh, perspective on what I've seen. Thank you very much, Rob. That was uh, wonderful. Riley, did you want to take over? Yes, I just have some last minute things that I'd like to say. Um, so thank you so much again for joining us tonight, Rob. We also appreciate all of our guests who came to this event, participated, and asked such insightful questions. Um, to keep up with Rob's work at ZooCheck, you can check out their website, www.zoocheck.com, and follow them on Instagram and Twitter at ZooCheck Canada and Facebook at ZooCheck. And of course, if you are interested in learning more about the Anthrozoology Certificate Program at the University of Windsor, you can check out our course website at www.uwindsor.ca forward slash anthrozoology. And although the U Windsor Anthrozoology Club will be going on a hiatus until the end, sorry, until the new uh, school year in September, you can still keep up to date with our club by following us on Instagram at UN Anthrozoology and Facebook at U Windsor Anthrozoology Club. Um, we'll start up uh, events like this in the new school year. So thank you so much again, everyone. Stay safe, take care, and have a great night. Thank you, Rob. That was great. Yeah, no problem at all. No problem at all. Hopefully uh, something would resonate with somebody out there. So. <laughs> okay.